Hey everybody, it's Thursday, I think it's Thursday, it's time for a little 21 chart action and today's topic will be about absolute and today's topic and we got sound which is always a great way to start the show. So let's, let's jump in and thank you all for being here. Thank you to the mods in the chat. I see you all out there. So today is about Bitcoin scarcity, reaccumulation. We'll talk a little bit about gold and correlations, S&P correlations, gold correlations to Bitcoin. You know, talk about $27 trillion of impact and how I spoke about this on the 20th of June, 2023. And now other people are talking about it eight days later. And we'll analyze what they think and what I think and how it all compares. We also talk about something that where I believe the future is actually here. This is a thing called Debridge from Solana. And I tested it this morning and it's really impressive. It's like a dream come true. Uh, in addition, we'll talk about Grayscale uh, discounts that are out there, some housing concerns, some inflation concerns, Tesla shortage, which is also very interesting and along the themes of kind of scarcity, um, AI, and so much more. A ton of education, I guarantee you. Guaranteed. All I ask is hit the like if you learn something new, and then you will. Guaranteed. So, and disclaimer, this is not financial advice, it's edutainment. And if you want to amplify your intelligence, as I say, you need to subscribe to this channel. I won't waste your time, but I will share lots of lessons every day. That's all I ask. So this is about the idea behind this. 21 charts is 21 million Bitcoin. And the fact that you can glean so much from one image. A picture is a thousand words. And if I had to do all of these, and by the way, it is called 21 charts. It's a little bit dishonest today because I have slightly more than 21 charts, but I couldn't cut any more uh, to keep it down to that 21 level. So it's a little bit over, but we'll go fast. So first of all, let's look at reaccumulation. It's happening again. So basically, you don't want to see a lot of red on this chart. That means people are dumping. But you've seen that since the beginning of this year, uh, particularly since the beginning of April, the big whales, the greater than 10,000 Bitcoin whales have been accumulating and we know who some of them are. Michael Saylor, of course, was doing a lot of nibbling at these levels. He's probably in some of these little blue boxes at the top. But now what's interesting is we've gone from everybody accumulating. OK, just in the last couple of days, uh, now especially the 1000 to 10,000 Bitcoin holders. So uh, despite the price being high, you could say. A lot of people are like 30,000, it's going to go back down to 9,000 or 11,500 or whatever the common numbers are in the echo chambers. No, it can't go down when it's being accumulated. Simple on chain math. And that's why we love it. Let's talk about supply retreating. I did show this as well eight days ago in Okta, or eight or nine days ago, <clears throat> but I'm stressing it again because it's too important. And other people are picking up on this fact as well. In fact, uh, this is from The Rational Root, and it was tweeted by Joe Burnett on Twitter. And again, this is about what I call supply retreating. And I did say when the first time I showed this chart that this time is different because the amount of Bitcoin available for trade normally goes up going into a halving cycle, but this time it's crashing down. Okay. Now there is a thing called the HODL model and the HODL model S, like I guess super fast or super something. But basically per the rational route, if the HODL model S comes to transpire, we could be at zero supply by the year 2028. And it's hard to even imagine what the price of Bitcoin would be at that. But according to Joe Burnett, he believes it is very possible that Bitcoin becomes digital gold. What that means is when the price of Bitcoin hits $500,000 of Bitcoin. Um, and that is because of absolute scarcity. And that would happen on the HODL model over the next, say, 4.6 years. So exciting chart. Uh, there will be a global lot of excitement if this does happen. And by the way, if we do get to the zero supply, the HODL model S, it's not unfeasible that we get to, I know it's going to be stupid. Zeno, thank you so much. I'm going to say this number so you can see my face. There is a theory that Joe Burnett said we could get to $10 million of Bitcoin if we go to HODL model S. So don't get too excited, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, that's way out there, but 
everything is possible, but this is why I'm obsessed with Bitcoin because it's so hard, so scarce. So let's jump and talk a little bit more about this. Now, as you know, the dollar has kind of regained a bit of favor globally and investors are selling things like gold and foreign currencies. They're plowing it into dollars and Bitcoin, obviously. So this is kind of interesting because here you can see that the people that have bought it aren't moving it. And less than 15% of Bitcoin has moved over the last six months. That's the supply active in percentage terms on this chart from Glassnode. So just think about that. All right, we, we, we probably talk too much about scarcity of Bitcoin, but that's the reason I started making videos in the first place is to share the scarcity story. And it is amazing to think 15% is all that there is to play with out there. All right. 19.3 million have been mined. 15% of that have moved in the last six months. That's it. The other 85% is held by people who know where the price is going. People like Joe here and the rational route. This time is different. This time is exciting. And that's why I urge everybody to stay healthy so we can watch the party. So that is kind of the move. And you're getting to see the scarcity story here. Let's talk about correlations for a second. This is the fourth chart of the day. Now, here you can see the Bitcoin S&P 540 day correlation. And it's down to 0 0.0663. Again, this is good news for Bitcoin investors because it means that global macroeconomic conditions may have less of an impact on Bitcoin in the coming months. So whatever the market does, Bitcoin doesn't care because it's suddenly broken free from its correlation with equities. However, we can also use our correlation monitor here to see that maybe it could change, it could turn around. But again, the correlation has fallen close to zero after several years of being very very strongly correlated. So again, another positive, and this is probably fueled by the whole scarcity narrative as well. Let's talk about gold because, you know, I've never, I'm not a gold bug or anything like that, but I just want to share some interesting pair charts. As you know, we like pairs here. In fact, somebody created a very funny meme of me with pairs. One day I might show it if I have the courage. But uh, one of the things to show here is year to date, Bitcoin divided by gold, Bitcoin is up. Bitcoin over gold pair is up 78% year to date. Basically, gold has been flat, had a tiny little pump at the beginning of the year, and it's kind of come down to earth. But even more staggering, which must be very upsetting to people that believe in gold and hold gold, is Bitcoin has done a 35x better than gold over the last six years. 35 times. I'm not even going back to all the history of Bitcoin because even then it's more drastic. But 35 times more is stunning. So even gold bugs are beginning to diversify a little bit of their gold bag into Bitcoin, which is exciting. Again, scarce as hell. Gold is there. You just need to dig a little bit deeper. You can get as much as you want. Speaking of gold declining since May 1st, it has really taken a bit of a retreat. It got a bit excited there, hit a new all-time high around the beginning of May, and ever since then has been on the down trend. And it was kind of low at the beginning of the year, trading at around 1650, shut up to 2040, and right down now about 1900. Again, to the dismay of many, but this is kind of a big global macro thing as well. Other stuff's happening too, is the Chinese yuan is weakening result will also impact on this too. Let's talk about Bitcoin dominance. Uh, another interesting thing, maybe not all good news about Bitcoin, but here uh, you can see the number of addresses with balance greater than 10K actually fell a little bit. We did say the 1K to 10K whales are stacking. This has fallen a little bit. Now this could be whales moving their big bags into a number of smaller wallets, I'm not sure. But this shows you that maybe there's a little tiny bit of a sell-off in Bitcoin when the big, big, big players that were accumulating before. Let me pull that back so you can see. This is the very top line of this chart here. You can see from about April 1st, the 10K plus were bagging a lot. And they did sell quite a bit over the past week or so, but they just started buying again. So we might see this chart uptick 
But again, we'll see over time. Um, next in the box, this is interesting. Willy Woo came out yesterday with this chart showing the big players that have come into Bitcoin, filed for things like Bitcoin ETFs and have set up some Bitcoin crypto specific businesses. Those names are BlackRock, Fidelity, JP Morgan Chase, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, BNY Mellon, Invesco, Bank of America. And interestingly enough, they have 27.2 trillion in assets under management. Eight days ago, I shared this chart. And it has the exact same amount, 27 trillion, but it's got different players. I have Deutsche Bank and Nomura on the list, uh, apart from his. But it's funny, no matter which way you kind of, there's an old expression, skin the, skin the cat. I don't mean cruelty to animals, but we come to the same $27 trillion number. But that's not the reason I'm talking about this. The reason I'm talking about this is Willy Wu believes if these players with $27 trillion, no matter which ones you look at, allocate 5% of Bitcoin, what it would do to the price of Bitcoin. He believes that we could go somewhere between the region of, again, more hopium here, 128K to 398,000. And the middle of the line is about $310,000 target. That is, if 5% of the 27 trillion goes in, that's about 1.35 trillion. And according to my models, that's not how it would work at all. So the way I do it is I have a thing called a multiplier. So if the 25% of the 27 trillion went into Bitcoin, it would go to about $1.35 million per Bitcoin. Let me explain why. Because I have my 21x multiplier that I proved that works. 1.35 times 21 is about 28.5 approximately. And uh, that would be 28.5 trillion in market cap divided by, say, 21 million Bitcoin gives you an easy 60x or about $1.35 million per Bitcoin. Again, these numbers are crazy. Please, just they're just interesting to look at, even if we get a tiny bit of the way there. And you know, things are stunning. But what I did say, though, if half of 1% of that 27 trillion went into Bitcoin, we get a 15x. And that you can take to the bank. That, I believe, will happen over the next year or two. Pretty, pretty certain that. And that's a tiny, tiny allocation. And that's the impact it'll have on Bitcoin price. So again, it's an exciting time to be alive. So let's talk about another piece of new news as well. I did do a Solana video yesterday. Afterwards, the price pumped, but I don't think it's because of me, of course, everybody. It's because the future is here. They did launch a product called DBridge. It's called a DLN cross-chain bridge. And I tested it this morning and I was excited and I believe the future is here. You know, we all want to find a DEX, all right? That DEX is very quick and easy to use. This thing, you just plug in your phantom wallet or whatever wallet, and you are in a position to trade your Solana or whatever asset you have on the Solana blockchain to whatever you want across many blockchains. You can, you know, you can, it is basically a Solana system that accesses an Ethereum virtual machine based blockchains such as Arbitrum without relying on any derivative tokens or wrapped tokens, which has been a pain for me and has been very off-putting for me in the past. But obviously, because it presents a security risk, it's not a pure form. And you know, if you know this channel, I like pure form stuff. But the DBridge Finance is that cross-chain bridge that allows users to seamlessly, literally, I did it, transfer assets between Solana and other blockchains um, it's up there working with, you know, Binance Chain, Polygon, Arbitrum, Avalanche, Phantom, etc. And again, there's very little slippage, very low fees. The bridging mechanism is based on an auton atomic swap, which is like a peer-to-peer -peer transaction that does not require a third party. This also means that dbridge's fees are much lower than those fees charged by centralized exchanges, and the spreads can be really tight. Also, security. It's a non-custodial bridge. That's why they may call it probably D-Bridge, which means that users retain control of their own assets at all times. No risk. And this makes D-Bridge a more secure way to transfer assets across blockchains and convert assets, etc. It is incredible. The future's here. And that is a powerful little tool. So if you do need to swap your assets for other assets, check it out. Uh, in addition, Solana NFT volume is up 2x since April. 
We know how fast it's growing. I covered some of that yesterday, so I will not dwell on that chart at all. But I will show you this other chart. Uh, this is from our IA engine. And I just thought it was super interesting to see the spread between different chains. You know, there's a lot of feedback yesterday from my video. By the way, I did a video yesterday. I'll add it here. I call it face-offs. It was extremely well received at 40,000 views in about 16 hours. And you guys want more. So uh, drop a comment below. I will be doing face-offs for more tokens. Whether you want to face off Optimism against Arbitrum or Cardano versus Phantom or Ethereum versus whatever, I will do it. Let me know what you're interested in. But this one is interesting. This is market cap divided by daily transactions. And you can see here, Sui did spike um, a while back, last week, I think. But now it's gone back down to earth, which is good. But just for perspective here, Polkadot uh, cost, <laughs> amount of market cap they have per daily transaction is $610,000. Yes, I know how Polkadot operates, etc. Ethereum, number two in the box, 211K. And the others you can see for yourselves. But the lowest in all of this, the amount of market cap per transaction is $315, which is for Solana. And that is far and away the cheapest value. And the big thing about how I invest, I like to buy things cheap that have upside. And I don't care what it is. Solana happens to be the flavor of the day. I identify cheap miners that got expensive and they fall down the list because they're not as cheap anymore. That's how I play. Would I buy Polkadot? No. Too expensive. That's the answer. So I'm trying to share this information. Speaking of another pair, this is Solana over Matic. It's up 134% year to date. And again, this is the amount of Solana divided by Matic. It went from about 12 to about 28 or 12. I can't read the exact number, but that is a big, big, big move. And again, that means Matic is drastically underperforming Solana this year. And Matic still has the third most activity of all chains. So that's a bit of a mystery why Matic is so weak. But we'll watch that carefully as well as we go forward. Let's talk about Grayscale. Uh, Grayscale Bitcoin Trust hit a 30% discount for the first time in a long, long time. The performance year to date has been stunning. Ethereum the ETH trust from me from Grayscale is down to 45%. It was at 55% just about 10 days ago. Big, stunning changes. And this is all of the excitement here around Bitcoin filing for an ETF. And they believe that Bitcoin will get approved. And that means the others will get approved shortly after that too. Also, uh, the SEC is facing lawsuits from things like Grayscale and Coinbase, etc. They've kicked a bunch of crypto hornet's nests and these hornets are coming back and they are stinging hard. So let's look at a new a model that we are putting together, a new miner dashboard for all the miners. It's going to have a lot more than this. It's just a bit of a sneak preview, but uh, it will be fully automated. We'll be able to see very quickly what is cheap and what is not. Now, the simple way to read this is if you look at there's many different ratios, highlight a few, and there's a lot more to the right of this that will be coming later over time. But if you look at, say, the market cap over hash rate, obviously the most expensive based on this metric is HUD8, followed by Riot, followed by Hive, followed by Marathon. And of course, the cheapest, things like Argo, etc., Iris Energy, DMG, CleanSpark, you know, they're cheaper. But the other thing that you have to balance, because no two miners are the same, is the productivity over hash which is kind of like of an effectiveness and efficiency ratio. And here you want that to be green. So you're looking for green numbers. And uh, the winner on this metric is, if I can see carefully, DGHI out of Canada. So again, all this stuff is a moving target. It all varies literally day to day, week to week, and definitely vastly month to month. But now I'll be able to keep post of exactly what is overvalued, what is undervalued, and then play the R between. That'd be exciting times. Uh, let's talk about Tesla for a second. The This is kind of stunning. Just, you know, there's people, there's analysts. I was going to make a fun video kind of showing how clueless the Tesla analysts are. 
And I probably will still do it. We'll see. But anyway, this is just yeah, Morgan Stanley said, well, EV adoption won't hit X percent until the year 2040. Well, look at Australia as a little case in point. And trust me, Australia is a vast country that needs to do very, very long distance trips. And I'm sure the infrastructure for EV charging is not like it would be in a place like San Francisco or something. But look at that cumulative EV sales spike from the year 2020 to today. It is insane. Uh, this is nuts. Now, EV penetration is still only 5.5% in the country of Australia. But what's really crazy is Tesla, all inventory, all stock of vehicles was exhausted, okay, in the quarter sales today. So they don't have any cars. You've got to wait three months if you want to buy a Tesla in Australia now before they get more. So sold out. Let's see what's happening in the US. This is Tesla inventory in the US. And remember, there is a so-called recession happening in many different places. But look at the amount of cars that were available for sale in the US. It's gone down. And there's very few traditional car makers that are facing this situation right now. Granted, the yellow is the Model X, which is the most expensive car, listing at about 110,000 plus in the US. Of course, they will get hit and there'll be more of those on the shelves. But if you look at the Model Y, which is in blue, not very many. We're talking about 200 in the whole country available for sale. And uh, that is stunning. The recession proof moniker that I gave Tesla, why I have a big position, something like right out the recession in, is surviving very well. And I am positive. Well, I should say optimistic. Nobody's sure about anything. But Q2 results could be very impressive. I know next year they will be. Speaking of a little macro news, uh, bit of sadness for our friends in Deutschland. German inflation did tick up quite a bit. They were hoping to have it under control. That is the European Central Bank and other people, the Bundesbank of Germany and stuff, but they don't. So you can see here the CPI upticked from 6.1% to 6.4%. And what is the culprit? Well, it's energy and food. Energy inflation is up 13%. 0.7%. So is food inflation. I may have got them mixed up or they're both the same, whatever. Either way, the food inflation is definitely 13.7%. And that is expensive. And that eats into people's pockets. And it's not just the UK has been hurt by that too. Do the central banks control the cost of food? No. Do they control the cost of oil? No. But they think they control CPI. We have all these central bankers, Lagarde and Jerome Powell and I forget, Bailey from the UK, and all saying, oh yes, we are going to achieve our goals of 2% inflation. It's just the silliest thing I've ever heard. It's nonsense. Anyway, enough of that. Meantime, though, in the US, inflation is down pretty hard, down around 2.48%. The government reports something a lot higher. But anyway, that'll come to fruition. And many expect deflationary numbers coming in the very near future as well. Now, let's talk about real estate. Now, a lot of people have been kind of interested in buying their first castle all over the world. I get requests every day. It's like, should I buy now? Whatever. And we covered that in the Q&A last Saturday. So check that out. But this is kind of scary. So when you look at this chart here, big thank you to Sanjay for sharing. This is how the median home price now costs seven and a half times the median household income. What's really scary is that little red arrow I added to this chart, this chart, the housing bubble back in 2009. Okay, it only went as high as about six and change. We are way above that right now. Okay, and that was a complete housing bubble time. So what's the situation now? I don't know. Could there be a crash? No, things are actually really surprisingly resilient. And a lot of that is because there's so little supply in the market, because people have locked in low rates for long periods of time, like 10 years and 30 years. And therefore, they're just sitting on their supply because it's like free money. You know, if you financed it two and a half percent for for 10 years, you're not going to walk away from that and then refi at 7%. It's insane. So that has put a bit of a lid on the amount of supply that's available. And therefore, it's now expensive. Again, think, think Bitcoin scarcity. And that's why this video is called 
super scarcity or super scarce. Uh, a little bit of a bad traditional omen. I bet you none of you know about this. This is the Hindenburg omen. And you can see here the Dow Jones US thematic market is down 15.5% over the last what's that, year or so, 12 months. And the S&P is up 15%. Weird. They've kind of gone completely opposite to each other. And this is the Hindenburg Omen, which is a technical analysis pattern developed by, I think, Jim Mika way back in the day. And it is based on the premise that when a large number of stocks make new 52-week highs in a short period of time, it's a sign that the market is overbought and a sell-off is likely. And that would be pretty timely because we know going into July and August, the markets are typically low volume, weak, they tend to go down. And this is triggered when certain conditions are met, I think, let me see, um, number of new 52-week highs in the New York Stock Exchange have to exceed 20% of the total number of stocks traded. Number of new 52-week highs in the NASDAQ has to exceed 10%. And the S&P has to close at a 52-week high. So we've got those three little checkboxes, which means there could be a little bit of energy coming out of the stock market right now. So we'll watch this carefully. The timing couldn't be more perfect for July and August, so we all kind of expect that anyway. In addition, a little AI news. I haven't spoke about AI in a couple of days. But this is from McKinsey. They do great research. And they found that 90% of commercial leaders expect this is 90%, a stunning amount, expect generalized AI solutions to be used predominantly or always over the next two years. The problem is at the top chart, you'll see they're not using them at all today. Rarely or sometimes is kind of the majority. But everybody that runs a big enterprise today want to make sure that AI is being deployed. So everybody out there, listen up, skill up on AI. If you want to, of course, make your bosses happy or even better, be independent and use AI on your own. So with that, everybody, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Adam Q out there in the chat and all the mods. Uh, appreciate you all. And I'll see you all tomorrow. Tomorrow's Friday. This week has gone so fast. I thought it was Tuesday. Thanks again. Have a good night.